Uh, really nice to see everybody here today. Um, this event features Cornelia Campos, a uh, prominent uh, Mexican-American painter uh, who's been active in the North Carolina arts community for about 15 years. Um, in conversation with UNC doctoral student in library science, Colin Post. And Cornelio is going to discuss his life and work as an artist and the process of building a personal archive to document his career. So, um, Colin Post is a doctoral candidate in the School of Information and Library Science at, the UNC, at UNC Chapel Hill where he is also pursuing a master's degree in art history. His research interests include artists' personal archives, community archiving efforts, and the history of art conservation. Before moving to North Carolina, Colin received his Master of Fine Arts in Poetry from the University of Montana and completed his undergraduate education at the University of Pittsburgh. Colin has previous, previously worked at the University of Montana Archives and Special Collections, the North Carolina Collection at the Durham County Library, I'm happy to say, um, and Charlotte's Mint Museum Archives. Cornelio Campos was born in Mexico in 1971. Following high school, he immigrated to Los Angeles to live with his great-grandfather, a U.S. resident since the early 1900s. While in Los Angeles, Campos began to receive recognition for his painting as well as several painting commissions. After two years in L.A., Campos moved to North Carolina, where for the next 10 years, he worked as a farm laborer with no time to pursue his painting. During this time, he took English lessons and became a U.S. citizen. He then trained to be an electrician, which gave him financial stability and, and fortunately for us, the ability to again pursue his artwork. In the early 2000s, Campos began to exhibit his paintings first locally and then more broadly. He is active, also active in the Durham community, working with groups such as El Centro Hispano and regularly teaching art through, um, art through workshops at local museums and schools. And before uh, Colin and Cornelio start uh, their conversation, Car Cornelio would like to introduce a couple of special guests in the audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, sharing this important day for me. It's really important for me to see you and also that everybody took the time to, to be here with me. I really appreciate and thank you. Um, I would like to introduce Charlie. Um, we've been collaborating with him for um, quite a few years and also um, we donate a painting that is gonna take several, I guess, months before it's displayed, but it's also is part now of the North Carolina collection. Two years. Two years. Uh, it will this, take two years. When this building reopens. Uh, and I think it's, it's really important for me, not also for me as an artist, but also the one of the programs that I was part, it was really successful. So I will um, invite Charlie to say a few words about it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I didn't prepare anything, but I'm, I'm so grateful to call Cornelio Campos my friend and also my um, collaborator on this art project that we did. It was called Puentes de Doble Dia, Two-Way Bridges. And in this project at Duke University, we worked together to bring artists and students from the broader community into the university classroom. And the, the logic of that is that we believe that it's not just about students going out and quote unquote helping the broader community but that we, as people who have been born here and lived here all our lives, can learn and, and appreciate the immigrant community amongst us. And, uh, and indeed, we learned so much. We then collaborated on a, a mural uh, that Cornelio led. The mural, is, the theme is about building bridges in communities, literally, 
this bridge, the theme is a, is a bridge, and unfortunately we won't be able to see it for a while, but you'll see it at the library. It's very large. I don't remember the dimensions, but it's at least 10 feet long, so it'll take up a, a major wall. And, uh, and just right when Miguel comes, I was just going to say, Miguel Ross and uh, Besaida Fernandez and, and uh, Cornelio, and I, along with uh, several other artists and visitors, work together on that. Mauricio. And, uh, huh? Mauricio. And Mauricio. And, uh, and we uh, are so happy that the library is going to be able to, to receive that. And uh, I guess probably 20 or 30 people worked on this mural, right? Again. And uh, so we're. Uh, we're really happy to be part of that, and thank you for the for, for the contribution of your work to this community. It means so much to all of us. Your your theme of of interpreting not only migration but but the the plurality of experience in our community, and our our gratitude is very deep for for all the art that you've done, and we can see it in places like uh, Coco Cinnamon on the side of the building, uh, down at, uh, at restaurants, in, in several restaurants in the community. It's just wherever you go, it brightens our lives, it teaches us about history and about the immigration experience, and we're so, so delighted to, to have Cornelio as part of our community. I also I would like to invite uh, Miguel Rojas. He will say a few words also. And, um, <laughs> I guess it's really important for me to have them here. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm running a little late. I'm going from far away. Uh, what can I say about Cornelio? I mean, all of you know him. Uh, I came here actually eight years ago, and one of the first things uh, as, a, as a migrant you do uh, to, to get to an, a, a place that you don't know is try to get where your people are. Then I'm not a religious person, but I went to church, uh, to the Catholic church. Actually, I was coming and the church was full of people. Uh, and uh, as soon as I got into the church, I saw these humongous paintings and this guy next to them. Uh, and, and I felt so good because I said, there is a celebration of what we are, right? In, in, in spaces like this, in the church, uh, but with things that are not uh, really, uh, because I saw the paintings, and the paintings are really critical about the experience of, of, of our lives as a, as a subjects of, of coloniality and the subjects of history, uh, as a subjects of, of marginalization, as people that are coming from, from, from the bottom up. And these were paintings that were talking about that experience. And they were in the church, right? And they were humongous. They were not small paintings. Then I said, wow. Something is going on here. Uh, then I had the opportunity uh, to start organizing little things, cultural events for, for the community too, within my work at Duke and, and out. And uh, we put together this small screening of a, of a, of a documentary uh, about something that is going on in East Durham. La Virgen Viene la Maldita Vecindad, about a celebration in November uh, uh, in which the community uh, gets together and dance, you know, very visible in the public space. Uh, then we put together this exhibit, uh, but in the middle of everything was Cornelio. Then in the, in, 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 uh, not only in the, in, the, in the documentary, but also when we showed this documentary uh, to the community, one of the many times that was shown uh, at Durham Tech, and also Cornelio came with this humongous paintings. And Cornelio was always in the margins, right? In the church, right there in the lobby, right? In the screening, right there, you know, in the lobby with his paintings. In the fairs, right, Cornelio with his boot and stuff. Uh, always in the margins. Like, talking about being a border subject, right? Uh, culturally and physically speaking. And, um, and suddenly, Cornelio, little by little, from the border to the center, right? Uh, started to, 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 I mean, to, to, to make it. Uh, as an artist, as to what he is, right? It's something that really moves him. Uh, and uh, I'm so, I, I, I only want to say that I'm really proud of being your friend, uh, being very proud of, of being able to watch, 
you've grown as an artist, as a person you are superb, as a father, uh, as, a, as a member of the community, uh, not only as a painter, but as a, also a dance uh, organizer and community organizer. And thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Now I have my friend Colin. So I'm really excited to uh, to talk with you today and to um, kind of discuss our project of taking your stuff, building it into a personal archive um, that documents and presents your career as an artist, um, and finding a home for it here, um, a really great place for it to, to be at the, the Durham County Library archives. So um, I want to talk with you about that process, but before we start talking about um, our archiving project, maybe we should talk a little bit about your um, work as an artist. Um, so let's just kind of start talking about your um, early career. How did you start painting? What made you want to, to paint? Yeah, pretend it's an ice cream cup. Okay. <laughs> Well, I would say it was uh, when I was a kid. What happened is um, somebody from my town was taking art classes, and during the weekends, he came and gave uh, art classes to kids. I was a kid at the time. And all his requirement was to have a notebook and uh, a pencil. So. I remember we used to go to church, and after church, there was a guy with a blackboard uh, inviting kids to come and start to do what he was doing, teaching um, how to draw. And it caught my attention, so uh, I joined them, but before I joined them, I used to trace comic books or try to imitate the colors of whatever thing was in a book or a comic book. And I try to imitate it, so it's how I start, I would say. Then, after that class, I pretty much, um, well, I joined the class, and then after that, I just pretty much follow the, the teacher. I was the, the shadow, you know. He didn't really kind of spend time to uh, teach me how to do certain technique, but just the fact that he allowed me to share his space, uh, that was enough for me to... Um, pretty much um, give me the curiosity and for me to pursue and, you know, try to be, you know, painting and try to be an artist, I would say, is how I started. So that's how you kind of um, got inspired to start painting, um, but what motivated you to um, pick up painting professionally um, after so many years? Well, this um, pretty much take me back to Mexico again. When I was 18, I finished high school, and I am the third of nine brothers and sisters, and, uh, you know, large family. We, I didn't really have a chance to go to, to college. I always had a dream to become an architect or become an artist, so once I find out that I wasn't able to go to college, uh, the other thing that we do in my town is, you know, is a uh, town of immigrants, so the easiest and fastest thing to do is to become like everybody else, yes, get to north and, and become a Norteño and start to pursue a different way and how to make life, and this how pretty much uh, brought me to United States. I was in LA, like I uh, did mention, for a few years, and uh, I got invited by my cousin, Salvador um, Queriapa. Every year, or almost every month, he say, hey, uh, what are you doing? I said, well, nothing, I'm just living from, I'm here with my relatives. And then he always says, are you start work? And I say, no. And you know, as an, um, Anybody who comes from Mexico to the United States, we're supposed to come and work. I'm not supposed to be doing nothing in the United States because, you know, it's already hard to cross the border. And then for me, kind of like saying I'm doing nothing, uh, it wasn't kind of like an answer for him. So 
every time he called me or I called him, he said, are you start to work? I say, no, but you know, I'm, I'm doing some paintings, but I guess a lot of times we didn't see uh, art as a career. We just have to pretty much uh, be consistent and believe in ourselves that we can make it. And I've been pushing uh, this belief since I was a kid, I would say. Yeah, now you are, you know, exhibiting, it seems like basically every month you have a new exhibition somewhere and you're um, very productive as an artist. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit more about um, your paintings and the kinds of things that you like to paint. Uh, so what are some of the things that inspire you? Um, what are the subjects you like to paint? Um, and kind of how do you decide what goes into a painting? Well, I will describe my art or pretty much divide into three, uh, three main um, topics, I would say. One is the Mexican folklore, the other is the um, my indigenous background from uh, Michoacán is called Tarascos in Spanish or uh, Purépechas in the uh, native language. And what I try to do is uh, focus a little bit into uh, the representation of my um, ethnic indigenous group from, from Michoacán. And like I say, you know, the uh, Mexican folklore and also the political topics. And I guess the political topics that develop over time, you know, after being um, pretty much, I would say, after a few years, you know, because first I come and then I have to learn the language, and then after that I have to adapt into this new culture, and it was hard. So, so pretty much it's kind of like a way to to express my, myself sometimes it can be a really successful thing or it can be a frustration or a bad day and it will come into those uh, political uh, paintings. But what I find out also about those paintings is that uh, pretty much I can say I do it because I express myself. But a lot of times I find out that it's, um, I'm speaking on behalf of someone else because they sometimes they come and say, oh, it's something that I will kind of like to express myself and it seems like you're already doing it and it's exactly what I'm thinking. So it's pretty amazing sometimes how powerful that, you know, art is because you are connected, you, and it crosses different uh, boundaries or different barriers. You don't, you don't have to be from the same place. And also you don't have to be either from, uh, uh, the American continent because I see that the art cross over, you know, all over the world and lately I had experience because I've been in contact uh, or people are, are contact me from uh, different countries like Germany or France or uh, Australia so it, it's amazing how art is, you know, how powerful art is. So you have um, exhibited all over the state, many different kinds of um, galleries and exhibition spaces. So do you want to talk a little bit about some of the different places you've exhibited over the last many years, um, and then maybe talk about some of your uh, favorite exhibitions? Well, like Lynn was mentioned in the <laughs> first thing she wrote, and also what um, Miguel was mentioned, I start uh, locally, like in, in matter of fact, here at the library, it was the first place who gave me the opportunity to exhibit my art. Because before I show here, I remember I used to show in church, like uh, Miguel mentioned, in multicultural festivals, or any place that I saw it was a chance to show my art. And I think it's been little by little, kind of like, I would say it's progressing little by little because, you know, I start local, then it was kind of like regional, then um, statewide. 
I think lately I'm gonna pretty much start to do be kind of like going national because lately I've been joining uh, other states in this December um, I'm collaborating with the Smithsonian Institute so I'm gonna be showing in Washington DC early December wow. it's a show is called uh, Gateway or Portales and this exhibit is gonna go from uh, we started in Washington DC for like about two months then it's gonna it's a trouble show it's gonna move after that to Baltimore for another uh, two months I would say and after that I moves here to North Carolina in uh, Charlotte area and then it's gonna end here in the triangle. I don't know exactly where, but uh, it, it start December uh, 2016, and it's gonna finish in October 2017. So that's that's really great. That's incredible. Um, and so I think, as we've all talked about, um, you've shown in a lot of different kinds of places um, from murals to businesses to um, galleries as well as personal collections people have purchased your artworks um, so a lot of people have kind of seen the finished product have seen um, the the beautiful magnificent paintings that you make uh, but not many people have seen what goes on behind the scenes um, and I think part of uh, why I wanted to work with you on building um, and preserving an archive of your personal stuff is so that that kind of work that happens behind the scenes um, gets documented and gets preserved for the community to see and for future generations to see. Um, so what were some of your kind of first thoughts when I um, first reached out to you about this project to build an archive? What did you think about um, archiving before we first met? Well, I didn't know much or oh, almost nothing at all about uh, archives. Because uh, for me, when uh, when you first approached me and you know, sent me an uh, email about your project, and then the first thing I think is kind of, you know, for some reason, I thought the archives is supposed to be old. And I was thinking, well, I don't have nothing old. So <laughs> what I can share. And um, then after that, I remember when we first met. And then I said, well, I think we can meet. And then you can teach me what um, archivals are. You know? And I think curiosity, you know, curiosity kills like that is what they say. <laughs> so, um, Pretty much, I pretty much open to learn, so that's the reason I said, Well, let's meet and let's talk about what we can do. And I did learn a lot. Yeah, I think that's really um, an important point to bring up that there's maybe a uh, popular misconception about what archives are or can be that you know, um, people think that archives are just something old, uh, you know, something that no one wants to use anymore, something from, you know, many, many years ago. Um, but I think what we're talking about is that you really had kind of your own archives of stuff that was important to you, um, just kind of collecting, collecting in your, in your home and studio. Um, so when we first met, we started going through some of the stuff that was important to you. We went through newspaper clippings, uh, flyers from previous shows, photographs, sketches of um, paintings in process. So uh, what, even though you really didn't have an idea, a formal idea of what an archives was, what kind of motivated you to keep all of that stuff over the years? Well, like anybody else, you know, we all have a um, we tend to to say things because it's important for us because it's, it belongs to us. But uh, one thing I really learned about is that um, 
it's really important to when well to be part of this, but um I think the reason I say all the stuff is because it was really important for me and but I didn't knew how important it will be for for other people because you know it's my stuff but um what I learned that whatever is important for you, it, it also can be important for uh, for someone else. In this case, for for the community, and not just for the community, also for uh, kind of like to show a specific uh, time in history. And that's one thing I learned. You know, even if it was important for me, that it can be important for. Um, for someone else um, in several years. Yeah, I think that's really, really an important point. Um, that kind of every time you um, recognize something that's valuable, either for yourself or for the broader community, when you choose to save that thing, whether that's you know putting it away on the shelf or putting it in a, a shoebox or um, just kind of intentionally saving it somewhere, you're really creating an archive that really that kind of intention to save something, that recognition that something is valuable, um, you're building your own personal archive, um, whether you know it or not. <laughs> um, so as we as we went along, worked on the projects, we um, organize things into um, more kind of uh, preservation friendly format, put things in um, special folders and boxes, um, and also created um, a finding aid to basically describe everything that's in the collection. Uh, so maybe do you want to talk a little bit about what that process was like for you? What, what were some of the things that you learned from building this archive? Well, the, the main thing for me, what caught my attention was to have the right thing to storage, um, whatever thing you want to preserve. Like uh, the first thing I noticed after you know, knowing the process, knowing what kind of paper you supposed to uh, save pictures or newspapers so or anything that you want to preserve, you just have to put it in the right uh, kind of folder because, uh, you know, you didn't have to tell me what I noticed that when I have my um, my pictures, it's one of those old-fashioned albums that you peel the plastic and they have the glue. <laughs> well, um, it was so long that I didn't uh, open the album and the first thing I noticed it was kind of yellow stripes all over the painting and, you know, that's an easy example that I can say how important it is to know how to preserve things if you really want to preserve. And you didn't have to tell me that because I, I can see myself that is damaging the paintings or the newspapers. Um, you know, I have some new, some new uh, newspapers that they win kind of like, you know, in anything so they kind of like fade a little bit. So that's that's the main thing that I learned. You know, it's really important if you want to preserve something, even if it's for a place like this to be in a in a public place, or even if it's for um, for yourself, you just need to put it in the uh, right container. Yeah, and I think um, right. It's important to preserve things not just because. Um, not just to do it, but so it has um, use over time, right? So we preserve things so that our stories get told, so that other people can um, learn about us, uh, can learn our stories. Um, and really, I think that's a central kind of feature of an archive is that it, it tells our stories, right? So your archive, the archive that we worked on together, really tells your story 
of how you developed as an artist, how your career developed over time, and it really captures and tells that story to, to anyone, anyone that wants to um, go through those materials. So um, part of the reason why we um, thought about donating this stuff here, to have it live here at the library so that more people could use it. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, what it meant for you to not only build your archive, but to have it here at the library? Well, uh, at the beginning I had kind of a mixed feeling. It's kind of like, um, you know, you think about, uh, well, I don't want nobody, you know, at least anybody to have access to my uh, personal stuff, or, you know. As an artist, it's kind of like people tend to try to find more about uh, about you, and also through the years, I had uh, to collaborate with uh, other students from different uh, schools or college or universities, and that's one thing I saw as an advantage that you know to have a central location where they don't have to call me or arrange a time so where they can meet me so I can share my stuff. Uh, I think it's nice for them to have an open space where they get, um, they can come when they have time and look these things without me being there. And, and I think that's, that's one of the big advantages that I, uh, I saw. Another thing was about um, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about what motivated me to be part of this. I think the main thing was because, you know, I have my stuff. That's true. It's, value, it's valuable for me, but um, it cannot be as same as valuable to someone else who had access to, to your stuff. I'm talking about in case, you know, somebody, uh, or in my case, what about if, an incident happened in my house. What about if my house uh, get, you know, flood or it got uh, on fire? Then all the stuff that I have there can be gone in matter of, you know, minutes, seconds, something that you've been kind of like collecting. And uh, at the beginning, I say, well, this is my stuff, but uh, What I learned is kind of like anybody can have their own uh, personal collection here in the library, you know, because at this point in time, and um, I think it's really important for us as a, a Latino community to take advantage of this uh, opportunity that the library is offering, pretty much. Uh, the main thing about this uh, event is to encourage anyone here in the public to Think about it, and I think we all are important. We don't have to be a, an artist or a writer or a lawyer. Just as a, a community member, I think sometimes we should share our stories, you know. It doesn't have to be somebody uh, who is well known or a public figure. I think anybody can have their own personal uh, archive because I think everybody has their own stories and it's important in in his own way. Yeah, I think that's a really a really great point. Um, that by keeping your stuff here, it's not only you know more safe from any kind of it's it's better preserved here. It's more safe from any kind of you know natural disaster like you were talking about. But it also has. Um, a bigger significance, right? It's really taking your story, which you've created over time, and putting it in this community space. Um, and that the archive does represent all of the voices in the community, right? Or it, want, it, it needs to represent all of the voices in the community. Um, and that everyone has the same kind of story that they can that they can tell and contribute, um, and the archive can represent all of those all of those voices together. Um, 
So do you want to talk any more about kind of how you, um, how donating your stuff here has um, kind of made you a part of the, the community or um, kind of your sense of your place in the community by, by including your things here? Well, I think the process is uh, really easy. One first thing is you be kind of like pretty much willing to, to share your personal documents. And um, I think that's pretty much the, the main thing and the hardest part because a lot of times you, like I mentioned before, you don't really feel like other people have, um, you don't want anybody to have access because, but also I think uh, you missing an opportunity because you never know the your story or somebody else's story can be your relative, your friend. I think it's important because I guess we, we learn a lot through through experience and uh, to have an, an archive is your personal experience. It can uh, contribute for something. Somebody who's doing a research about uh, X team that and you know it's available in a library, it's available in, in a public place, you know, more people have access to. And um, that really help people who are involved in uh, researching and doing a project. That you never know how you can contribute in society by just having your story available. You can, you know, make somebody's life easy to, to their project or to, you never know, it can be inspiring uh, other people to, to do certain things. I think it's really valuable to, to be part of this and to be able to uh, have this uh, material uh, accessible to, to other people. Yeah, I think that there's a really um, interesting and powerful connection between the work that we were talking about um, your art doing your art as this um, force that you know can communicate these ideas powerfully um, to a wide community of people um, across you know this across this country but across the world um, and really that your archives can do similar work. Your archives also, you know, can communicate, can tell your story. So just like your artworks can tell a story, your personal materials, your archives can also tell a story, can also communicate. Um, do you see any other kinds of um, connections between your archives and your artwork? Do you see ways in which your archives relate to your artwork or support your artwork? It does because um, it does support my my artwork and it somehow well really uh, well related I would say because um, the same way I tell a story in my uh, paintings in my political paintings I think this <coughs> reinforce uh, what I'm doing right now. Is either for me personal or for the community or for the uh, as a Latino artist so for whatever reason it, it does help a lot because like I mentioned before it's a really uh, a strong tool to have. Yeah so I think now I want to invite Lynn um, to say just a few words about other ways that the um, library can serve as a resource for for archiving and for preserving the community's history. So I'm going to talk just for a couple of minutes, and then if you all have any uh, questions for Colin and Cornelio, you can can ask them at that time. Um, well, the North Carolina collection here, which I'm head of, is uh, its main reason for being is to preserve and make available Durham's uh, historical record. 
Um, and while Durham has uh, more books published about it than probably a lot of other towns do, um, still uh, many parts of Durham's story just aren't told in those books. Uh, so to tell more of Durham, Durham's story, the North Carolina Collection seeks out uh, individuals and organizations to donate materials, uh, things like photographs, letters, programs from events such as plays, church services, funerals, concerts, um, that sort of thing, meeting minutes and other materials from clubs and organizations, scrapbooks, business records, and on, on and on, anything that helps tell the story um, of our community. So um, if you go to the North Carolina Collection website and look at the section on papers of individuals and organizations, I, I think you'll be surprised and really impressed with the breadth and the depth of materials that um, are there. Papers, photos, scrapbooks, all kinds of things. But we still have more work to do to, to truly represent the Durham community. And um, a primary area that does need work is uh, representing better the Latino community. In the 1990 census, Durham County had a Latino population of about 0.75%. In 2000, about 7.5%. And in the 2010 census, around 15%. And we're, we're still growing. So uh, a big shift for this state uh, since 1990. And because Durham's Latino community is so new, the North Carolina collection doesn't have a lot of information on it in the form of either books or papers. Uh, in fact, Cornelio's materials are the first set of papers from a Latino member of the community to be added to the North Carolina collection. And I want to thank him and, and Colin for first kind of brokering that, making that happen. I'm, I'm hoping in the question and answer session Colin will tell us a bit more how, how, uh, how he, why he's involved in this. Um, so Cornelio has given the community something truly priceless, um, a piece of Durham's story, your story, uh, that will now be preserved for you and for future generations to, to marvel at, to learn from, to be inspired by, and, and just to enjoy. Um, so I hope if you have materials yourself or know of a friend, a neighbor, um, a co-worker, an organization you belong to that, that does have materials that tell part of Durham's story, um, especially at, at this time I said we're, you know, we're interested in the Latino community, um, I would love to hear about them. I've got a uh, contact me about materials sheet back in the back that allows you to write your name down and um, your contact information. And, and if you have materials or would like to hear from the North Carolina Collection, I'd really appreciate it if you put your name down there uh, and we'll be back in touch with you. And I think working together as a community, uh, we can keep Durham history, which is your history, um, alive now and for future generations. So any questions for, oh, and Jenny Levine has something to say. One more quick point, I should apologize, I forgot to mention, speaking of archives and records, that the People's Channel is here today recording this program and it will be available on our website in probably the next month or so. So if you know someone who really needs to watch it, you can send them back to the DurhamCountyLibrary.org website and be able to capture this, this great event. All right, question? Hello, my name is Jose Gambas. This is kind of a difficult question, kind of directed both to Lynn and Colin. As an artist, I've always had problems with archives. It seems that artists were always being asked to donate, to give for free from our collections. And I want to commend Cornelio for, for donating his work, but I've always found it kind of difficult when I'm approached by institutions, uh, programs, publications, can you donate one of your photographs for work? And I know, I know for, for a fact that these institutions, uh, these collections have budgets for individuals <laughs> that they can go after. The, uh, I don't exactly know. Not the Durham County Library. <laughs> well, 
but there's ways to do it. There's ways to do it that uh, the institutions can approach these individuals, these donors, these friends of libraries or friends of whatever. And I, I, I don't think these institutions do enough of a job for the artists. I know that Cornelio and myself kind of, we struggle. We put things together to make a living. I do a lot of programming, a lot of college presentations, exhibits for fees, but nevertheless, I find it that it's always, you know, a juggling act in terms of having the income coming in. So how can these, uh, how can institutions work to make it more equitable for the artists so that we're not always being put in a position where we have to donate our work to a collection or donate a piece of a photograph for a book or what have you? Thank you. Um, that's a big question and I'm not sure I can fully answer it, but I will say in Cornelio's case, we, we try to, uh, and you know, working very closely with him and with Colin, we took, I believe, three paintings, either three or five, anyway, that are representative of different points in his career, and he selected those. We don't have, you know, we're a public library. You all who live in Durham County pay for, for what we do here at the library. We don't have, you know, we have a very small book budget, and we don't have a budget at all. We do not acquire archives. Uh, by paying for them. We, we can only acquire them through donations. Um, and, and I guess the thing, and, and that's not that that might not change in the future, but certainly at this point we would not have the funding and, uh, to do that. I do think one of the benefits, though, of, you know, it's, it's you know, a very small part of his work, and what we, what I think what Cornelio gets from that, as, as the discussion went earlier, is uh, it's another avenue to publicize him too. It, you know, people can um, go on the North Carolina, or they don't even have to go on the North Carolina Collection website. They can Google his name and one of the things that will pop up anywhere in the world is uh, the finding aid for his materials. And of course most of what we have is not paintings. Most of what we have is uh, programs from his exhibits, kind of some working materials, publicity materials. So the you know the, the the very few paintings we have are a small part of this collection. But we did want some rep representative pieces. But I do, I hear what you're saying. But I do feel that um, it, it is another means of getting his name and his work out in in the community and and beyond too. You guys, well maybe uh, Colin can don't address that from the UNC. Point of view. Sorry. Mike, what you saying? Uh, what did you say? The whole thing over again? No, just uh, Colin. Can Can Colin maybe address this from the UNC perspective, where maybe there's more resources? I know that Duke, because I, I I've had my sort of problem with Duke has quote billions of dollars, but yet. They have very little money when it comes for artwork or collections. And I always find it kind of like head scratching. So maybe you can address it from, if you have any sort of insight from the UNC side. Um, so I can't personally speak for uh, the um, archivists that do collecting for the UNC archives or or Duke's archives, um, but to kind of clarify my um, affiliation with UNC in relation to this project, um, this started through a uh, grant-funded project based at UNC called Learning from Artists Archives. It was an IMLS-funded um, project. It's the Institute of Museum and Library Services. It's a federal granting body, um, and that project uh, was for UNC um, library science and uh, art history master students to do projects like this in the community. So there are six fellows, and we all um, worked with, or in the pro or in the process of working with, um, an artist to help them support their personal archiving practices. 
Um, and really one of the goals of this project, which is also included um, uh, workshops for artists, um, is to help um, empower and equip artists with skills so that they can um, do a lot of this personal archiving work um, and to create archives that are support their own personal work um, so they don't, you know, they can do a lot of the stuff in their own personal collections um, outside of institutional support or outside of institutional um, interaction. So, I mean, I think hopefully one of the long-term benefits of this work with um, Cornelio is that you now also have skills to think about your own stuff in terms of, of archiving. Um, and so you can kind of continue to develop um, your personal archives of stuff that you're still working with um, in addition to the things that are um, stored here at the library. Um, so I mean, it doesn't really, I, like I said, I can't speak for um, UNC's archives collecting uh, policies or budget, or and certainly not Duke's. Um, but I think part of the, the impetus and goal for this is to um, support and sustain personal archiving practices um, that don't necessarily depend or involve um, institutions as well. Other questions? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drag this thing as far as I can get, and then I'll ask you to meet me. <laughs> First of all, I want to congratulate Cornelio for all uh, his achievements and the fact that he's spanning and he is a personal friend for so many years. For me, my family made me very proud. Thank you very much for all uh, for being a, a source of a, a inspiration to others. And I have a question for you. Uh, probably during this transition, you had so many obstacles. What would you say was the biggest obstacle to get to this point? Well, um, I can say that big obstacle sometimes is myself. We have to believe in ourselves because uh, nobody else is going to do it for us. Any kind of obstacle is just material or a person who has a position to either say, agree, approve, but that doesn't mean that's the only person that is able to do. Um, I will consider myself lucky. I don't think I have any, I didn't really have any obstacles. Well, Besides the you know language barrier and also um, technology, because I'm from you know kind of like the old-fashioned world. Um, if I mention obstacles, yeah, it will be pretty much a language and also uh, technology, because I had to learn uh, technology in order to do. I'm still struggling, so yeah, I would say that as, as my main obstacle. But other than that, I don't think I really had any obstacle. Yes, in order you know. To be, uh, to be there and to pretty much be available for anybody who support you to, and anybody else who believe in you because uh, I don't think this, I will call this is my personal success. I think this success is uh, in all these people who, it's not just hundreds, I would say at this point it's thousands of people who had believed in, uh, for some reason, uh, support my art. And I can say that from, you know, from when I was a kid through all those years, through all those places where um, I was passing through, I would say, to this point, um, is hundreds of people uh, behind my, my success. Because they believe in me, somehow they support me. And, um, Every day I find more people who keep uh, supporting me, either by telling me and admiring what I do, and that inspired me to, to keep going. Maybe one, one more question. 
I just want to interject it when you were saying that uh, your biggest obstacle was not to believe in yourself. You, you've been my friend for many years so far, and I always believed in you. I always encouraged you to do the best that you have to keep growing. To look at you, man, where you are right now. <laughs> not because I said it, but because you are, you are who you are. And the fact that you put everything to work is what have come or brought you to this point. I believe in you, I, I congratulate you, and I'm not surprised that these gentlemen are telling you that they're considering your, you, you, their friend. You're my friend too, and I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you.